I've uh, passed the 65-year mark myself, but I'm nowhere near ready to retire. My mother was my role model. Uh, she was working full-time at the age of 82, and I guess I got her genes. My husband, on the other hand, is retired and loves it. So he said, uh, you know, you can talk about that you know what retired life is like from watching me. He joked that when he retired that it was twice the husband and half the pay, and I was a little bit nervous about it. Uh, but it's actually turned out quite well. He's very supportive of what I do and enables me to be where I am today. So Tanya said um, we were going to talk about organization, and I would like to ask you a question. When you think of getting organized, what does that mean to you? Give me some feedback. Scares me to death. Scares me to death. Okay. Anybody else relate to that? Yeah, okay. What else? What else? What does organize mean? Everything in its proper place. In its proper place. What else? Being able, to find everything. Being able to find everything. That sounds, oh, it's like, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Yes? Figuring out what to toss and what to keep. How many of you have that as a question? What to toss and what to keep? You know, that's actually what got me into this business of taming the paper tiger. Because when I first started in residential organizing in 1978 in New York City, the question that everybody asked me was, how long do you keep? And the one that came up the most often was bank statements. Maybe because they're kind of bulky, you know, and they have lots of numbers on them, and it looks like the IRS might want them. And so I went to the library to get a book. I figured there must be a book on how long do you keep things. And much to my amazement, there was not. And I thought, now this is truly interesting, that here's a subject that everybody needs to know. It doesn't matter whether you make $18,000 a year or $800,000 a year. Whether you're 18 years old or 80 years old, you still need to know how long do you keep. And so I began to research that, and out of it came the book, Taming the Paper Tiger. And today, the focus of what we do, and when I say we, that's this group of certified productive environment specialists, we help people identify what we call the seven information management questions. What do you need to keep? In what form? For how long? Who's responsible for filing it? Who needs access to it? How do we find it, and how is it backed up? Every individual, every family, every organization needs to answer those questions, and that's really what we focus on. My company's called Productive Environment, and I define productive environment as an intentional setting in which you can accomplish your work and enjoy your life. Now, your environment is everywhere. When you think of environment, what are some words that come to your mind? Give me some feedback. Exactly. You think about the outer world. I mean, we think about clean air and green and all that. But then we also think about our home. And that's true. But you know where else our environment is? It's in our brain. Your brain is an environment that totally dictates what kind of a life you have. My business has been based for these 35 years on four words. Clutter is postponed decisions. I learned that from closed closets. Closed closets fill up because you haven't decided whether you're really going to lose the 10 pounds you need to lose to get back into that suit again. Or that exercise equipment looked really good on Home Shopping Network, but it hasn't been out of the closet too much. Or then there's the candlesticks you got from Aunt Sally, and you love Aunt Sally so much, but they're not really your style. But when she comes for Thanksgiving dinner, if you had them on the table, she would be so thrilled. Well, the same thing's true of paper. The paper piles up on the kitchen counter or the desk, and you say, OK, today's the day. I'm going to clean this up. And you pick up the first piece of paper, and you think of any number of reasons why today is not a good day to deal with this piece of paper, and so you put it over here. And then the second, and the third, and before you know it, the pile that was on this side is on this side, and goodness gracious, 
I have to go to a meeting. Anybody ever done that? Or, and then those of you who've gone to email, how many email users do we have in here? Same thing, right? Sit in front of your email, open, close, open, close, open, close. And before you know it, 45 minutes have gone by and nothing has really happened except that you feel a little more discouraged because you're so far behind and there's so many things you need to do. So the first environment that we need to approach when we're trying to accomplish our work and enjoy our lives, which is really what my passion is. My passion is helping people accomplish their work, whatever that work is, and enjoy their lives. And the first environment we have to approach is our brain. If you don't think you're organized or you don't think you can be organized, then you're absolutely right. That's exactly the way it'll be. In all the years I've been doing this, I've never met anyone that couldn't get organized given a system. And Tanya mentioned that what she had gotten from me was a system. I remember many, many years ago, don't we love technology? <laughs> many, many years ago, I was hired by librarians to come and give a speech. And I have to admit, I mean, this was, I'd only been in business a little bit, and it's like, librarians? Well, why are librarians calling me? Isn't that what they go to school for? So I was very nervous about it. But then I discovered that librarians love systems. They're very good at implementing systems, but they're not so good at figuring them out. That's not the creative side. They're, that's not tends to be their strength. But they loved it when I showed them a system, which I'm going to describe to you in a minute, called the Magic Six. I was like, wow, this is awesome. I can do this. Uh, and several years ago, probably 25 years ago now, I organized a librarian at, a, uh, at Cameron Village Library in Raleigh. And a few years ago, or a few months ago, when I went to the library to give a presentation, I was thinking, I should really check in with Benji and see how things are going. But I have to admit, I was a, a kind of a little bit nervous about it, because it's like, well, you know, what if it didn't last, or what if it didn't work? So I called her and I said, Benji, this is Barbara Hemphill. I don't know if you remember me. She says, oh, yes, I do, and my desk is fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm all about systems, and I want to give you today some ideas about systems that you can apply to your environment, whether it's your brain, uh, we're going to talk about the art of wastebasketry. Uh, if your brain is full of, oh, I can't be organized, that'll never work, I shouldn't have done that, I can't do that, that's not an environment in which you will accomplish your work and enjoy your life. So we have to get rid of those kinds of things as well. When Tanya first came to work with me and she told me that her company was Structured Chaos, I tried to talk her out of that title. So I said, that sounds like an oxymoron to me. But then as we explored it, it's like, you know, it, the reality is we live in a chaotic world. And frankly, it's not likely to change. That's really what it's about. Uh, the Bible says, uh, ye will have tribulations, but be not disheartened. I've overcome the world. Well, what we're about is helping people control the things they can control so they can cope with the things they can't. In other words, structured chaos. So now I completely support that. So she, she made me a winner. So let's talk about, I want you to think for a second. I want you to leave here. Take it seriously that you're here. And I want you to leave here with some, some very specific things, even if it's just one thing. If you're here and you leave here, with one specific thing you can do differently as a result of being here, then I think it'll be worth your time. So I want to just stop for a second and invite you to think about a specific area of your life or your home or whatever, if you're in a business, in your business, that you would like to be more organized. I just want, you don't need to share it with me at all. I just want you to get it in your head. So that as you're listening to me, going forward, you can say, OK, how can I apply these principles? I believe very strongly in principles because principles are timeless. They're going to be just as good 20 years from now as they are now. I looked at Clutter as Postponed Decisions in the first book that I wrote in 1988. And it's like, Clutter was postponed decisions then? And guess what? They, it still is. So think for a moment and just put that in your head. 
What one thing in your life would you like to improve so that you felt more organized? Got something? Everybody got something? One thing? Doesn't have to be the most important thing. OK. One of the things I've developed over these years is something I call the productive environment process. It's a five-step process that we use all the time. So when someone says, I need your help, the first thing we say is to do what? What is it you want to organize? Is it your kitchen? Is it your filing system? Is it your life? Is it your business? Uh, is it your purse? Is it your car? Is it your garage? Is it your papers? Is it whatever? Doesn't matter. Just pick one. So then we do step one, and step one is state your vision. If this area of your life were organized, what would it look like? What would it feel like? What would you be able to do that you can't do now? And the clearer you are about that vision, the more successful you're going to be. Proverbs says, without a vision, the people perish. And as long as we have a vision and we're moving in that direction, we're going to feel hopeful. I've often said, what I want on my tombstone is she gave others hope. So state your vision is step number one. Then step number two is identify your obstacles. What is preventing you from getting that vision? What have you tried before that didn't work? Or what are you afraid might prevent you from being successful? Then number three is identify your resources. What, what do you have that might help you? Maybe you want to organize your kitchen, and your resources are x number of cupboards. Those are the resources you have to accomplish that in your kitchen. Uh, if it's you want to keep better contact information, maybe you've got business cards all around and now you can't even remember where you got the business cards, but yet when you need the plumber, you can't find the number for the plumber to call. Well, what are the resources that you would have for that? And we'd identify, maybe it's a Rolodex, or maybe it's a computer program, or maybe it's a notebook. And then step number four is, Create and execute your plan. I grew up on a farm in Nebraska, and one of the things that my father used to, a phrase that he used to use was where the rubber meets the road. And step number four is where the rubber needs, meets the road. That's where you're going to create and execute the plan to get the vision you want. When it comes to the vision, nobody owns that but you. If you work with Tanya, She's going to ask you what it is that you want, want, and she has nothing to do with your vision. She's not going to, it's like you're saying, this is what I want. You own it, and no one else has anything to say about that except you. But then we go to step two, your obstacles. You obviously know some obstacles, but I suspect we know some obstacles that you don't know about. You know, you, because we've been in business a long time, we know that this is probably going to be an obstacle that you didn't anticipate. Or maybe this is an obstacle you thought was an obstacle, but we know that it isn't. And the same with resources. You're going to have some resources. Well, I have this Rolodex, or I have this notebook, or I have this software program, or I have this cupboard, or I have this file cabinet, or whatever else it is. But we know some resources. Quite often, they're resources that you have that you never even thought about. It's something you already have you're just not using it very well. A great example of that is email. How many of you feel kind of frustrated with the amount of time it takes you to deal with email? Well, you know what? Research shows that whatever email program you're using, probably you're using less than 20% of its capability. The email has the ability to help you if you knew how to use it. One of the other things my daddy used to say is half of any job is having the right tool. Well, he was almost right. It's not just having it, it's using it. So 80% of what we're doing is helping people use the tools they already have. They're just not taking full advantage of them. So step number four, I, uh, design and execute your plan, is identify to, to reach this vision 
overcoming these obstacles with these resources, here's the plan. And then we get to step number five, and that's actually the most important one. Because so many times, and we see it all the time, where we go in and work with somebody, often somebody who's actually hired an organizing consultant. And that organizing consultant came in and sorted things and labeled things and color-coded things and left, and everything was just beautiful. And then six months or a year or two years later, what do you think it looked like? The same as before, because they thought it was about the stuff, and it's really not about the stuff. It's about the person. So step number five is sustain your success. That means when we go in to put a system together, it's not going to work right the first time, probably. We might get it, hopefully we'll get it at least 80% right. But we've got to adjust it to make it match your skills and your preferences. Organizing is an art. Now, some of you look at me and say, okay, you're just a naturally organized person. You know, you're just one of these people that handles a piece of paper only once. Well, Tanya can tell you, taint so, McGee, as my mother used to say. I am a right-brained. I've been diagnosed with ADHD. I love the big picture, but the details get a little sketchy. And I love to start things. Oh, do I love to start things. The follow-through, now that's a whole other issue. So I can make a mess faster than anybody else. So the reason I'm really good at these systems is because they've come out of my own pain and because I've used them in my own life for three decades and I've identified thousands of people in these three decades who can use them as well because they're principles. They're not saying this is where this goes or this is what you should do with this. One of the things that, oh, I want to go back to those five steps. State your vision, identify your obstacles, commit your resources, design and execute your plan, and sustain your success. What's the common word in those five steps? Your. your. It's all about you. It's what do you want to do, which is what makes this fun still, because I've never met two people who are exactly the same or two organizations that are the same. And even when people get things in order for a while, things change. Your health changes, your support system changes, you move, you add an employee, you take away an employee. And so always we're needing to adapt those systems, but the principles remain solid. Research shows that 80% of what we keep, we never use. I've proven it over and over and over again. And more importantly, the more we keep, the less we use. Because it's too difficult to find. We forget that we have it. We buy greeting cards to send to people. This is going to be a great card for my brother Al. And then Al's birthday comes and goes. And two months later, it's like, oh, there's the birthday card I was going to send to Al. So, how do you control, what do you do about that? Well, I'm a firm believer that one of the first places you want to start is with what we call the art of wastebasketry. Now, notice I call it an art. People are often afraid when an organizing consultant comes around because they say, you're going to make me throw away things. No, I'm not. Here's the truth. You can keep everything you want if you're willing to pay the price. So our job is not to say, oh, you don't need that. Our job is to say, if you choose to keep this, the price you will pay in terms of time, space, money, and energy is so much. Now you make an educated decision as to whether or not you want to keep it. Let me give you an example. Nearly 25 years ago, I had a client in Virginia who was an amazing woman. Oh my gosh, she was amazing. She worked for the government in a very high position. She was a quilter. She was an artist. She built computers and she drove race cars. And she had a hook on one hand. But she also had a very difficult time giving things, letting go of things. And she had a lot of stuff of her own, but then her mother died and left her 
20 dressers full of paper. She moved from a big Virginia plantation, and every time she got that full, she bought another one. So here she was. She only had one daughter who said, Mom, throw it all away. I don't care about any of it. So my client was left to sort through all of those things at great agony. And she couldn't just dump them because there were stock certificates and very important things in there that really needed to be retrieved. So one of the things that we came across were greeting cards. She had hundreds of greeting, greeting cards, that some that she was going to send and some that she'd received. And she said, oh, I can't throw these away. They're so beautiful. You know, and they, they caught lots of money. And they came from people I really care about. I can't throw them away. So I said, fine, you don't have to. Let's think about how you want to organize them. Well, you can organize greeting cards lots of ways. You know, you can do it in baskets or boxes or files or whatever. So we discussed all the potential ways that we could organize them. I don't even remember what they were at this point. But we came up with a way that she was happy with it. And one of the things you had to keep in mind was, OK, it's going to take this much space for what I have already, but I have to have that much space for the next 10 years. And one of the reasons that systems fall apart is because people organize what they have now. They don't allow anything for growth. So once we were done, I said, OK, it's going to take this much space to put this system together. It'll take this much time. It'll take this much money to buy the supplies. And it'll take this much of my time. So it will cost you, and let's say I said $200. I don't remember what it was. But let's say I said $200. Well, one person might say, $200? to organize greeting cards? That's insane. And somebody else would say, hmm, $200. You know, I spend that on a weekend. When I go out for the weekend, I go to the beach or somewhere and go out to restaurants. And they could imagine when they were 85 years old, sitting and looking at those greeting cards and remembering those people and the happy memories. And so for them, it was like, that's fine. Clutter is postponed decisions. So in order to make a decision about something, you have to identify what is clutter to you. I never say to someone, you don't need this. I will ask, I'll say what I would do with it. If it were mine, this is what I would do. But because that's what I would do doesn't mean that's what you could do. So the art of waste basketry is some ways that you can identify. There's a whole series of questions, and they're on the handout that you have there. But the bottom line question is, What's the worst possible thing that would happen if I didn't have this? If I threw this away, this bank statement or this whatever, and it turned out I was wrong, what could potentially happen? And is that a price I'm willing to pay? So for example, somebody might say, two people might say, looking at the same thing, and one might say, if I threw this away, uh, my brother would be mad. The other one might say, they might both say that. And one of them would say, He'll get over it. And the other one will say, I don't want him to be mad. I'm going to keep it. That isn't right or wrong. That's different. That's where your personality and your, um, your desires and your passions come into it. So whether or not you keep something, you can ask the question, does this help me accomplish my work or enjoy my life? Does this item, whatever this is, whether it's a gadget in the kitchen, or an item of clothing in your, in your closet, or a, a piece of equipment in your garage, or a piece of paper, or an email. Does this help me accomplish my work or enjoy my life? And if it doesn't, it's by definition clutter. How many of you sometimes have difficulty getting rid of things yourself? Does anybody in here have trouble with that? That's usually an 80% response, which is about what I've gotten here. So it's something that I've uh, explored over the years. I wrote a book several years ago called Love It or Lose It, Living Clutter-Free Forever. And in the research for that book, I talked to lots of people who had trouble letting go of things, or I talked to people who knew someone, maybe in their family or just a friend or in their community, whose life was really, really paralyzed from their clutter. Maybe not the kind you see on hoarders, maybe not to that extent, but certainly people where they didn't have people come into their homes because they were embarrassed about how it looked. And I began to ask questions. And what I discovered was so interesting. 
If I ask enough questions, I would find out that that person who had trouble letting go of stuff had at some point in their life experienced a severe emotional loss. Maybe it was living through the depression. That's a really common one. But other ones, um, I told that story in New York City at Barnes and Noble when I was autographing books. And a, a young man in his late 20s came up. And he said, my apartment is so full of things, I haven't had my family or friends in it for months. And he said, I go home from work every night and say, OK, tonight's the night. I'm going to clean this up. And he said, I start sorting on my bed, because that's really the only flat surface I have that's got very much space. And he said, some nights I can barely crawl into bed, and my body just becomes paralyzed. He stopped and looked at me, and a little tear came down his eye. And he said, my mother died when I was six. He said, are you telling me that I have to deal with the grief of losing my mother before I can deal with the clutter? I said, you know, I really can't answer that. I'm not a mental health professional, but I can tell you what I've seen through the years. And that is, if you will find someone that you trust, be it a friend, family, or a professional, to help you go through and identify what you really need to keep in order to accomplish your work and enjoy your life, and you are willing to let go, it's amazing how the emotional healing will begin to follow. I said that one day at a conference, and a woman walked up to me, and she said, well, you just saved my marriage. I said, wow, that's a pretty dramatic statement. Tell me what you mean. She said, I came to this conference with the intention of going back and telling my husband, to whom I've been married for 13 years, that I was leaving. She said, our house is completely full of stuff. Uh, I have allergies. I can't keep it clean because of all the dust and everything there. And she said, he will not throw away anything. And then she stopped, and she said, his mother died when he was seven. She said, I never understood before that when he didn't get rid of things, it wasn't that he wouldn't, but that he couldn't. She said, I'm not sure how I'm going to go back and deal with it, but I'm willing to try again. And so I said, may I make a suggestion? She said, of course. I said, go back and say to that person, you know, I." I never understood before how important all of this was or is to you. She did that, and I stayed with her for several, stayed in touch with her for several months after that. It changed everything. Because God has this amazing sense of humor. He usually gives us, makes us find a partner who's different than we are. My husband's a keeper, and he's not organized, and he has no interest in being organized. He said, that's why I married you. Well, the interesting thing is the more one is a keeper and the other one's a thrower away, now we've got this push and pull going. As soon as she gave him permission to keep, the dynamics begin to change. And then he was willing to say, you know, I really, could, I really don't need to keep this. And we did some very creative things like taking photographs of some of the things because what he wanted were the memories, not the actual physical thing, but the memory of the thing. And we began to explore, how can you let go of things in a way that makes it easier? And I have a new story that just got, Tanya hasn't even heard this one. This is just a couple of weeks old. I was in um, New York, or in uh, Buffalo, New York, speaking to uh, auditors of a bank. And we were talking about this issue. And this one woman said, my husband died 10 years ago. And she said, I still haven't gotten rid of all of his clothing. I just, it's just too painful. So we began to talk about how giving them away is a good thing, giving them to other people who are really going to use them. And then at break, she came up to me and she said, I, she said, I just figured out what I can do. She said, when I give something away of David's, I'm going to give something away of mine at the same time. She emailed me a couple of weeks later and said, I am so excited that I'm now able to let go of this after all these 10 years. So I hope that if you have trouble letting go, or if you know someone who does, if you have trouble yourself, I hope this will give you something to think about. And if you know someone, I hope you can understand that 
it's not just that they're lazy or they don't, they're not willing to do it, but it's really an emotional pain that's preventing them from doing it. Now, when I started in this business, it very quickly became evident that the biggest organizing challenge was paper. How many of you left home this morning with more pieces of paper lying around than you prefer? You know, this was supposed to be, yes, <laughs> two hands. This was supposed to be the paperless age, right? Weren't we moving to the paperless age? Well, actually, in my experience, what we have now is actually the worst of both worlds. Because we, have, we haven't gotten rid of all the paper. It's not really possible to get rid of all the paper yet in 99% of the situations because the technology hasn't quite gotten there yet. But by the same token, we have the technology, but it doesn't do everything we want to. So we end up now, if you've tried to go online to pay bills, well, some of your line, bills get paid online, and some of them maybe you haven't done that yet. And even if you pay it online, they send you a piece of paper, and now you look at the piece of paper, and it's like, OK, I, I think I sent that online, but I'm, I'm not really sure. So now I have to go online to see if I really paid that piece of paper. Now, when I was doing the paper, it was real easy. And I have to tell you, moving to technology for me was not a pretty process. I liked organizing paper. I figured it out. I spent two decades figuring out how to do a filing system, and I could find anything in it in five seconds, just like that. It was so reliable. So I was like, why in the world would I want to not do this? Well, unfortunately, if you want to be in my business and you're going to help people manage information, you're going to have to change. So I had to change, too. But that's another reason why I'm good at what I do, because it didn't come easily. I had to figure out how to do it. Remember those bank statements that I mentioned earlier on? What's the purpose of a bank statement? To find out how much, to balance your checkbook. And do you know how many thousands of people there are with decades of bank statements filed in garages, attics, and under the bed that have never balanced their checkbook once? <laughs> Pleading guilty. Why is that? Because it has numbers on it. And we think if it has numbers on it, the IRS wants it. Well, I've spoken to many accountants who assure me that's not necessarily true. The bank statement has the who it was written to, but it doesn't say for what. So you can't give somebody a bank statement and say this is a tax deductible expense. So when I wrote Taming the Paper Tiger at Home, which is Tanya has a copy of it back there, now it's called Organizing Paper at Home, one of the things I did was I went through all of the papers in the household that could possibly be there, recipes, artwork from your grandkids, coupons, junk mail, everything, and said, let's put some questions in place. Let's put a system in place to help you manage it. And part of what evolved out of that was what I called the magic six. And if you look on the handout down in the left-hand corner, you'll see the magic six. And I want to present that uh, to give you a system. The magic six came because um, I worked for a while with a company developing software. And prior to uh, releasing that software, I organized 200 individuals. And I said, I know everybody's different, but I have this feeling that there are some organizing tools that are non-negotiable, that certain things must be in place. And it was out of that that I developed the Magic Six. So I want to go over it. We can't go it in, over in depth, but I want to give you the overview of it. Tanya knows it very, very well. So if you're interested in learning more, she can help you. But I want to point out how that works. Number one in the Magic Six are your desktop files. Here's one of my favorites. It says in, out, and file. In means I haven't looked at it yet. It's the mail I've taken out of the mailbox. It's the things my husband's given to me and say, you know, you file this, you take care of it. Out is the things that need to go someplace else, to the post office or give to my husband or take someplace else. And file means it needs to go in the filing cabinet, but the filing cabinet is on the other side of the room or in another room or someplace else, and I'm not going to go now. The idea of the magic six is that, first of all, in your house, we call it the home office for the business of life. Every household needs to have a physical place that you sit, and here's the catch, that you like. 
where you deal with this kind of thing. Now, many people have a place, but it's kind of like it's the undecorated bedroom up on the second floor that's hot in the summer and cold in the winter. Or maybe you do it from the dining room table, which many people do, and that's doable if you have the right tools. But the idea of the Magic Six is you want to be able to sit in that chair, wherever that is, and reach everything in the Magic Six. So that's number one. Number two is wastebasket, recycle, and shred. Number three uh, is your calendar. Whatever the calendar is, I use something called a planner pad, uh, which I used for over a decade. Then I decided I was going to go to electronic. I tried electronic for a while. Uh, didn't really like it all that much, so I went back to planner pad, and now I use both. My calendar is electronic, but this is my to-do list and where I can capture everything. And Tanya can tell you more about that, but I absolutely love it. Number four is your contact management. Remember I talked about those business cards that you have, but you can't find the number to call the plumber? Everybody needs a system for keeping track of names, numbers, and phone numbers, uh, email addresses, and things like that. And there are many, many ways you can do that. Then number five are action files. That means the ball is in my court to do it. Uh, pay a bill. Uh, do some research on uh, our furnace is getting old and I know we're going to have to replace it so I'm beginning to do some research or we're planning a vacation or we're planning a family reunion or I want to do some volunteer work or I'm, I'm the, on the board of, a, of an organization. So it's the ball is in my court to do it. And those files can be organized three different ways. And one of my favorite ways is by date. So for example, this, this is a a file that has 31 file folders for the 31 days of the current month and 12 files for the 12 months of the year, and this is the 29th. So in my briefcase, which is down there, is number 29, and in it are the things that I'm going to do today. And it easily will sit on top of a counter or some real easily way, so nothing important ever falls through the cracks again. So when my husband comes back from the doctor's office and he gives me the little piece of paper that the doctor gave him that said, come back again in three months, He's terribly disorganized and he would forget it. He just hands it to me. So I look at it and say, oh, you know, you're supposed to go in August. So I pull out August. I stick that piece of paper in August. And then when August comes, I take all the papers that are in August and spread them out 1 through 21 or 1 through 31 on the days they need it. So I love that tool. Another way you can organize action files is by what the type of action it is. My favorite one is waiting for response. You've ordered something from a catalog. And you have your notes, you know, maybe you printed them out from the computer or maybe you did it by hand, but this is the catalog and here's my, my number. I put it in waiting for response. And then maybe once a month at the very least, I go through, oh, you know, I never got that that I ordered. So now I can pull it out and put it back in a date file to say, I'm going to call them tomorrow to see why I haven't gotten what it is that I ordered. And then the last way you can organize action files is by the name of the project. So for example, family reunion planning or uh, board meeting or whatever. And then we come to number six, and number six is reference files. And number six is everything that you just don't know if you'll ever need it, but you don't have the guts to throw it away. And you can keep as much of that as you want if you're willing to take the time, space, and energy to file it and keep it. But what Tanya will tell you is that we don't want you to have a filing system. We want you to have a finding system system. It's very easy to say, where can I put this and stuff it someplace? This is really important, so I'm going to put it here so I don't forget it. And then, oh my gosh, I know, I, I know I put that somewhere. Where was it? Well, what you need is a finding system. So simply asking the question, how can I find this again, as opposed to where should I file this will, will make a difference. But the real key for a finding system is very simple. It's a file index, a list of the names of your files. A file index is to a filing system what a chart of accounts is to accounting. You can't manage your money if you don't have a chart of accounts so that the same kind of expense gets charged to the same line item each time. It's exactly the same with a file. A file breaks down because the same information can be filed under automobile, car, Chrysler, transportation, or vehicle. I think of automobile. My husband thinks of vehicle. 
So if he were to file, which he would never do, but just if a miracle happened and he needed to look for it, he would go to vehicle and it wouldn't be there. And so he'd come and say, where's the files for the Toyota? And I would say, it's an automobile. Well, the problem is automobiles in the top drawer and vehicles in the bottom drawer, so he wouldn't see it. If you have a file index, it's very easy to look at the index and scan down those names and say, oh, that's what she called it. So with a finding system, the longer you use it, the better it gets, whereas a traditional filing system, the longer you use it, the worse it gets. So I would challenge you that you go back to your home and identify, first of all, where is the place that you are physically going to deal with writing thank you notes, deal, dealing with consumer issues, uh, ordering things, paying bills, whatever it is, and make it a place you like to be. My favorite story about that was there was a woman who was a client of mine. She just died recently. She was the ambassador to Madagascar. And she had actually traveled with our first lady all around the world. And she had a beautiful home. Um, and, but it, one of them was a condo in Washington, D.C. And she heard me give a speech. And she said, OK, I need you to come and help me with the clutter. Well, I went to the house. And it was a beautiful house because she had things from all over the world where she traveled. But there were little piles of paper everywhere, in the bay window, beside the chair, in the kitchen, beside the bed. And she said, I'm just tired of this. So I walked through a condo, and in the front entrance was a small closet. I opened the closet, and the vacuum cleaner hose fell out. Some discussion revealed that she didn't even use that anymore because she had a cleaning service who brought their own vacuum. And then there were eight coats, and some discussion revealed that only two of them she ever really wore. And then there were lots of things there, books and things, that had been left by a house guest that she was always going to return. But by this time, she didn't remember which house guest it was. <laughs> so we took the, the rack out for the clothes, put in a counter high shelf, put a stool underneath it, put a two drawer filing cabinet, put hot files on the door. But the thing we added that made all the difference in the world was a radio. Because her favorite radio program was All Things Considered. And it happened to be on about the same time she would come home from work. So she could take the mail out of the mailbox in the front lobby, come in, open the door, pull out the stool, flip on the radio, and now she was willing to make decisions about the pieces of paper and get them into her magic six. Half of any job is using the right tool.